Hello YouTube! So in this video we're going to talk about some of the metaphysical puzzles that arise with ordinary objects. Uh, now there are lots of objects and properties that raise philosophical puzzles, uh, moral values, mathematical objects such as numbers and sets, uh, minds and phenomenal properties, modal properties like necessity and possibility. Um, but then of course you know there are these uh, ordinary everyday objects that are directly present in our experience, you know, chairs, tables, trees, mountains, knives and forks, heads and hands. Um, and, you know, we, I mean, very often we sort of assume that the, the objects like these can be taken for granted. Um, I mean, of course, there are, you know, sceptical scenarios that challenge the existence of such objects, uh, like maybe I'm dreaming, maybe I'm uh, a brain in a vat, maybe I'm being deceived by a super powerful evil demon. So maybe the external world, as I seem to perceive it, doesn't exist. But as long as we put scenarios like that aside, it seems fairly straightforward to say, well, you know, I have hands. Or, like, there is a tree in the garden, you know? I mean, just look, I, I open my eyes and these things are right in front of me. Um, but in fact, these ordinary objects uh, raise a number of problems. And in this video, I'm going to introduce some of these problems. Uh, what I want to do here is, is just outline uh, these problems, so I'm not going to focus so much on what solutions uh, might be provided. Uh, I just want to raise some challenges to our ordinary ways of thinking about objects. Um, also, this is not an exhaustive list. I have covered some of the puzzles concerning ordinary objects in previous videos. Uh, see, for instance, my video on the problem of the many. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to talk about all of the puzzles, but I will talk about some of them. Okay, so let's begin. So a first problem is that it turns out to be surprisingly difficult to uh, figure out what principles govern material composition. So ordinary objects are composed out of other objects. My hand, for instance, is composed of bones and blood and flesh, and then bones are composed of mineralized tissues and bone marrow and cartilage and so on, and then these tissues are composed of molecules, molecules are composed of atoms and so on, down to fundamental particles. So all of the ordinary objects of our experience are composite objects. They are composed of parts. Now this leads to what is known as the special composition question, which is, under what conditions do two objects compose a further object. So, you know, we assume that my index finger and my palm are both part of my hand. They are two objects that, among other things, uh, compose a further object, my hand. And my hand, together with other things, composes the object that is my body. But now if we take, you know, my left index finger and the moon, well, these are separate objects. They don't compose anything. Or so we normally think. So the standard view is that sometimes composition occurs, so sometimes two objects will compose a further object, and sometimes it does not occur. Sometimes two objects don't compose anything. So my left index finger and the moon, and the moon uh, do not compose anything. That's, that's kind of the, the common sense way of thinking about objects. But it turns out to be very difficult to come up with um, principles that that accommodate these beliefs about ordinary objects. So one initial thought is, look, um, ordinary objects exhibit a kind of unity, right? Their parts are contiguous in space. So my left index finger is connected to the rest of my left hand. So we might suggest that uh, the answer to our question, under what conditions do two objects compose a further object, is provided by the principle contact. For any x's, there is a further material object Y composed of those X's, if and only if those X's are in contact. And this is why there is not an object that is composed of my left index finger and the moon. They are separated by hundreds of thousands of miles. Uh, unfortunately, there are, there are some difficulties for this. Um, so one thing is that merely putting two objects in contact doesn't seem to create a further object. My cup is currently on the table in front of me. It is in contact with the table in front of me, but the cup and the table do not form a single object, at least we would ordinarily think. And, you know, even if I visited the moon and touched its surface with my left index finger, um, you know, my finger and the moon would not then form a single object. 
Like if, if contact were true, then on touching the moon, this would make uh, a new object come into existence, my body plus the moon, and uh, this object would then be destroyed merely by removing my hand from the surface. Uh, or to give a, a, another example, you know, when I shake somebody's hand, it doesn't seem that I form a single object with that person. So what, what these sorts of thoughts suggest is maybe we need something stronger than contact. So an alternative suggestion is that composition requires a kind of fusion. Um, so for any x's, there is a further object y composed of those x's if and only if the x's are fused together. Or as uh, Peter van Inwagen put it, the objects must melt into each other in a way that leaves no discernible boundary. Uh, so does this work? Well, on the one hand, uh, actually, this, this still seems too weak because, you know, even if you were to fuse my hand to part of the moon with some sort of unbreakable glue, um, it still seems that my body and the moon would not compose a single object. Um, but more importantly, there's, uh, there's actually a more serious problem for any kind of contact style answer, which is that they are all too restrictive. Uh, the reason is that among the ordinary objects, there are various scattered objects that, that are not in contact, um, where, whose parts do not contact other parts. So consider the United States. Um, we ordinarily think the United States exists, but Alaska and Hawaii are separated from the United States mainland. Um, they're all part of the same country, though. Or consider the solar system. Planets, asteroids, and comets are separated by millions of miles, but it's natural to think of the solar system as an object. Um, force acts across the solar system, but there's no material contact. Indeed, in principle, um, it might be that all composite objects are scattered objects, because you know, on, on current physical theory, subatomic particles like protons and electrons do not come into contact, they're separated by repulsive forces. Uh, and the distance between the nucleus and the electron in, at, in an atom is actually analogous to the distance between the planets in the solar system. So uh, maybe it turns out that all ordinary objects are, uh, are mostly empty space, they are scattered objects. Um, I mean, at least that, like, yeah, that. Who knows, right? Maybe, uh, maybe that that science scientific theory will be superseded. Um, maybe it actually already has been superseded because uh, you know we now know that things like electrons and protons are not exactly particles; they're more like you know clouds of probabilities or whatever. But the point is, is that in principle, yeah, it could, it could, it seems like it could turn out that all ordinary objects are scattered objects. So here's an alternative strategy. Maybe what matters to composition is what the parts of the object in question are doing. So the thought is, what matters is the fact that the parts collectively perform some function is what is kind of tying them together into a unified whole. That's what, that's what makes them a single object. So if you think about a hand, for instance, a hand um, is, it performs various functions, like it functions to grasp other things. So, you know, I use my hand to pick up, a, pick up a cup. Hands function to grasp objects. And all of the parts of the hand, you know, the fingers and the palm and like the bones, they're all kind of working together to execute that function. Uh, similarly, hearts function to pump blood. A piece of clothing functions to keep us warm and dry or to help us conform to modesty norms. The United States performs various functions for its citizens. Um, maybe we can even say that like an organism functions to achieve the continuation of its genes or its species. By contrast, there is no function that is performed by the combination of my left index finger and the moon. So it's not um, kind of, it's not material contact that matters, but, you know, performing some function. So we have the principle of functionality. For any x's, there is a further material object y that those x's compose if and only if the x's collectively perform a function. So, um, you know, uh, this, this helps us to account for scattered objects, but this does run into some serious problems. The first difficulty is that this notion of function is extremely controversial. It's not at all obvious under what circumstances a set of parts performs a function. Indeed, it may be that there simply are no objective functions at all. Um, so it might be that attributions of function are just a matter of convention um, 
I, I, uh, I won't go into this in too much detail here, but I do have a video on functions in biology, um, which you can check out where I uh, outline a, a kind of conventionalist account of functions. Um, in any case, so, so yeah, I mean, just a point to bear in mind here is that if we're appealing to this notion of function, we're going to have to do a lot of work to make it clear um, exactly what a function is and like when a set of parts performs a function. But even if we do this, even if we can nail down an acceptable notion of function, it really does seem like there are going to be some composite objects that do not perform functions. So like, what, what is the function of a cloud, or the function of a rock, or the function of the planet Saturn? Now of course these objects have various causal connections to other objects, and of course we may use these objects in particular ways. So I guess a, you know, like, we might say that a rock can, a rock can function as, let's say, a paperweight, so it can perform the function of a paperweight when I use it for that purpose. But the vast majority of rocks are just, you know, out there independently of any use we might have for them. Um, so they're not functioning as paperweights or as anything else. At best, what we can do is, you know, describe how rocks and clouds and planets interact with other objects and how they fit into larger systems. But then, you know, we can do the same for, uh, for, for kind of exotic objects like my left index finger plus the moon. So I can take my left index finger and the moon as like a thing and then I can describe how it relates to other things. Like the exotic object of my left index finger plus the moon has a center of gravity and that influences the behavior of other objects and so on. Um, so, you know, uh, functionality turns out to be, uh, again, an another sort of problematic uh, uh, principle. Anyway, as a result of these difficulties in coming up with principles of material composition that square with our ordinary object beliefs, many philosophers have been driven to favour uh, one of two extreme views. So first, there is compositional nihilism, which says that no composite objects exist. No two material objects ever compose a further object. So all that really exists are uh, fundamental particles, or simples um, is the uh, term that's, that's sometimes used. And, you know, like most uh, people who are nihilists are going to identify simples with fundamental particles. Um, not all of them, but we don't need to get into the uh, the precise, you know, we don't need to get into all the gritty details here. The point is, on nihilism, there are no composite objects. No objects have parts. So, strictly speaking, there are no hands or chairs or trees. Um, there are, at best, only particles arranged hand-wise or particles arranged chair-wise. Uh, so there's just like, there's just swarms of particles um, and composite objects are all just kind of illusions. Um, second, there is compositional universalism, which says that for any two objects, there is always some further object that they compose. Composition is completely unrestricted. So my left index finger plus the moon is an object, and it's just as, you know, it's just as legitimate an object as a hand or a chair. Um, so on this view, ordinary objects do exist, but there's nothing metaphysically special about such, such objects. Um, like, <laughs> you know, yes, there are, there are hands and trees and chairs and cups, but there's like a whole load of other, you know, like left index finger plus the moon plus Donald Trump's hair, right? Like that's also an object that has the same kind of metaphysical status as a hand. So in this respect, the universalist is, is also going to suppose that we are seriously mistaken about um, ordinary object facts. All right, so um, I suppose that the sort of the important point here is ordinary objects are composite objects. They are composed of parts, but it turns out to be extremely difficult to give an account of the conditions under which composition does and does not occur. Um, it turns out to be very difficult to give an account of that that squares with our ordinary object beliefs. So that is one major puzzle about ordinary objects. Okay, it's the puzzle of what are the principles of material composition? A second puzzle for ordinary objects is the causal redundancy problem. Consider a baseball that is thrown towards a window and that shatters the window. We would ordinarily say that the baseball caused the window to shatter. If there are baseballs, then they have causal powers. Baseballs are the kind of thing, you know, they're the kind of object that, if they exist, they would shatter windows, and they would produce particular visual and tactile sensations, and so on. 
But there's a straightforward argument that what we call baseballs cannot have causal powers, because baseballs, if they exist, are composed of smaller parts. I mean, ultimately, they're composed of fundamental particles. And what's actually doing the causal work are the particles that compose the baseball. Like, when the baseball is thrown towards the window, what ultimately causes the shattering isn't the baseball, right, but it's just particles. It's specific particles and their relation to other particles. And of course, this point is completely general. We can, at least in principle, give a complete causal explanation of everything we observe by appealing only to fundamental particles and their relations. The objects supposedly composed out of those particles play no causal role. As Peter van in Wagen put it, all the activities apparently carried out by shelves and stars and other artefacts and natural bodies can be understood as disguised cooperative activities of simples properly arranged. And therefore, we are not forced to grant existence to any artefacts or natural bodies. So here's one way to put the argument a bit more formally. Um, the baseball, if it exists, is causally irrelevant to whether its constituent atoms acting in concert cause the shattering of the window. The shattering of the window is caused by those atoms acting in concert. The shattering of the window is not overdetermined. So the baseball, if it exists, does not cause the shattering of the window. Um, so what is this, this thing about over, overdetermined? What is this notion of overdetermination? Well, an event is overdetermined if it has at least two distinct causes, each of, which, each of which would be sufficient on its own to bring about the event. Um, now, of course, events will have more than one cause. You know, an explosion may be caused by both a spark plus the presence of flammable gases, right? But in these cases, the different causes are like jointly necessary for the event to, to occur. So, you know, if you just have some flammable gas without a spark, there's going to be no, no explosion. If you have a spark without the flammable gas, there's going to be no explosion. In the case of overdetermination, there would be multiple causes, but each of those causes are both sufficient to bring about the event. Now, um, clearly, the collection of atoms arranged baseball-wise is enough just on its own to cause the shattering of the window. Um, of course, it's also true, I suppose, that the baseball is enough just on its own to cause the shattering of the window. But there is an asymmetry here, because in supposing that there is a baseball, the baseball must be made up of stuff, right? There must be atoms that constitute the baseball. But in supposing that there are atoms, we are not thereby forced to postulate a, uh, an object, a baseball, that they compose. So the thought is that whether or not we say that there are baseballs, Right. Regardless of what view we have on whether or not there are baseballs, there are surely atoms arranged baseball-wise. And the atoms arranged baseball-wise are what have the causal powers. They're what are actually, th those, are the, those are the things that are actually doing the causal work. The baseball itself is inert. Um, so this leads to the, to the conclusion then that, that if the baseball exists, it doesn't cause the shattering of the window. And then there are kind of two ways we can go from here. So we can make a, I suppose, a, a sort of, um, so one, one, way, one way we can argue then is to say, well, positing baseballs leads to a kind of inconsistency. Um, so this argument is suggested by Trent and Merricks. Merricks says that baseballs, if they exist, would have causal powers. Baseballs, if they existed, would be the kind of things that would cause windows to shatter and that you know, would cause uh, various perceptual experiences. I mean, after all, we take it that objects like baseballs are things that we perceive. I mean, a, a baseball is, <laughs> you know, probably thought of as like a, a paradigm example of like a perceptual object, right? Um, but we perceive baseballs because they cause light to deflect into our eyes. A baseball without causal powers would be completely imperceptible. Um, but like baseballs are typical examples of, perceptu of perceptual objects. So if we say that baseballs exist, then we're going to end up being committed to the, contrary, to the contradictory position that they both have causal powers and do not have causal powers. So baseballs cannot exist. So I guess this is a, a, a sort of, more, you know, like, uh, yeah, driving for a more s sort of strong conclusion where we're saying, right, that the concept of baseballs is just incoherent in some way because it commits us to saying that baseballs both have causal powers and do not have causal powers. Even if we don't want to make this inconsistency argument, though, um, 
we can say at the very least, uh, at least if, if you think um, that uh, baseballs do not have causal powers, we can at the very least say, well, in that case, there's just no need to suppose that there are baseballs. Um, since the causal power of the atoms constituting the baseball, um, that, that sort of preempts the causal power of the baseball. There's just no work for the baseball to do. Like, um, so, you know, we can appeal to principles like Occam's razor, which tells us not to multiply entities beyond necessity. Uh, baseballs are causally and explanatorily redundant, right? We can explain everything that we perceive without postulating baseballs. So there's just no need to postulate baseballs. So we shouldn't postulate baseballs. Um, so again, I mean, so the, the key thing here is, right, regardless of whether or not we postulate baseballs, we, ha we, we have to postulate that there are atoms constituting the baseball, that there are atoms arranged baseball-wise. But the point is, is that the atoms arranged baseball-wise are going to, like, e explain everything, right? Like, that, that's, uh, that gives us the kind of complete causal and that gives us the complete causal explanation. Um, so there's just no need to say, in addition, there are baseballs. And so we shouldn't posit that there are baseballs. <clears throat> Okay, a third problem concerns the relation of material constitution. Uh, so ordinary objects, as we've seen, are made up of matter. So let's consider a, a statue made out of clay. Um, we seem to have a single object here. We, we have a statue that is constituted from clay. Uh, and when we talk about the statue or when we talk about the piece of clay, we are apparently referring to one and the same thing. So let's say that it's a statue of David. OK, David names the statue and then Lump na names the clay out of which David is constituted. So uh, the, the puzzle is this. We assume that David is identical to Lump, right? David has exactly the same parts and is located in exactly the same place as Lump. I mean, we, like when you look at this, so we, we have here a, uh, a, a statue of David Bowie and like looking at that, you'd say, well, yeah, there's just one thing there, right? There's this statue of David that's made out of clay. It's one thing. Um, so in this case, like David and Lump are different ways of referring to one and the same object. But the puzzle here is that David actually has different properties from Lump. So, so the statue has different properties from the lump of clay. So suppose I flatten the statue. Well, in that case, David no longer exists. The statue of David has been destroyed. And yet the lump of clay that constituted the statue, that continues to exist. It's all the same stuff. All the same stuff is still there. All the same matter is still there. So that lump of clay is still there. Um, the lump of clay can survive being flattened. The statue cannot. So it seems that you know, that, that we have like the following claims, that David exists and Lump exists, David is identical to Lump, David has different properties from Lump, but if, if David has different properties from Lump, then David can't be identical to Lump. So I guess to, you know, again, put this a bit more formally, right, we'd say uh, premise one, David cannot survive being flattened. Premise two, Lump can survive being flattened. That leads to the conclusion that David and Lump have different properties, different modal properties. Um, and then premise three, if X and Y have different properties, then X and Y are not identical. So this is the, uh, uh, yeah, this is a highly intuitive principle, indiscernibility of identicals, right? If two things are identical, then they are one and the same. So they must have the same properties. Um, so, uh, and all of this leads to the conclusion that David is not identical to Lump, which is a bit strange because, um, you know, it seemed like we had just one object there, but now this conclusion is telling us actually there are at least two objects there. There's David and Lump, and they are different objects. Okay, so one natural response to this problem is uh, the thesis that constitution is not identity, um, which says that objects are distinct from the matter that constitutes them. So the, the statue is not identical to the clay that constitutes it. David is not identical to Lump. So on this approach, we simply accept the conclusion of, of the argument we've just seen. In fact, with our clay statue, there is not one object, but at least two objects. There is the statue and there is the lump of clay that constitutes it. And, you know, I mean, it might sound rather strange to say that when we create a statue, there are really two objects there occupying the same space. Um, but, 
you know, in, in, in other ways, this kind of view maybe does square with our ordinary thinking uh, about, about objects. But this uh, position, if, if we embrace this position, it faces what is known as the grounding problem. So according to this view, David and Lump are distinct objects um, because, you know, David cannot survive being flattened and Lump can, so they have different properties. <clears throat> now the question is, what explains this difference? Because right now, David and Lump are located in exactly the same place, made out of exactly the same material. Um, indeed, we can even suppose that David and Lump come into existence and go out of existence at exactly the same time. So imagine if an artist sculpts the top half of David and the bottom half of David in different places, then one day he brings those halves together. In that case, the statue of David is created at the same time as Lump is created. Um, you know, but so like by bringing two masses of clay together, the artist has created a new lump of clay. Then one day, um, instead of flattening the statue, the artist just smashes it into pieces. That would simultaneously destroy both the statue and the lump. Um, so, it, so now David and Lump share all material parts. They exist for the same period of time. They have exactly the same relations to the things going on around them. And yet, if we say that constitution is not identity, then we have to say that David and Lump are distinct objects with distinct properties. What explains these differences? How can they have distinct properties? Um, so like compare this to, you know, if I say, for instance, like, okay, salt and sand are distinct things. Why? Well, you know, salt dissolves in water and sand does not. If I were to place the salt in water, it would dissolve. If I place sand in water, it would not dissolve. So, you know, there's a difference in properties. But like this difference is straightforwardly explained by differences in the physical properties of salt and sand and how they each interact with water molecules. <clears throat> in the case of David and Lump, right, we're saying that there are these distinct things, but any difference between them just seems to kind of float free of like the physical facts. So that seems rather strange. Okay, next up, there are various Sorites arguments. My hand is composed of billions of atoms and surely I could remove one of these atoms and I would still have a hand. In fact, that is constantly taking place because I'm, you know, I'm shedding skin cells. So I'm not just, <laughs> I'm not just losing one atom, right? I'm, I'm losing billions of atoms, right? But um, like, you know, you take a hand, you remove one atom, you still have a hand. Now, um, yeah, like given how tiny atoms are, it's surely the case that a single atom could not make the difference between having a hand and not having a hand. So uh, we have a principle that says for any number n, Right. If n atoms compose a hand, then n minus 1 atoms also compose a hand. But by repeated applications of this principle, we would get the result that a single atom is a hand. <laughs> and of course, the same argument can be applied in reverse. A single atom is not a hand. And for any number n, if n atoms is not a hand, then n plus 1 atoms is not a hand. Like just, if you, if you have something that is not a hand, then adding one atom to it is not going to change it into a hand, right? But by repeated application of this principle, we get the conclusion that there are no hands. So where then is the line between having a hand and not having a hand? I mean, I clearly have a hand, right? And an amputee, clearly does not have a hand. Like this is me on the left here, this is my hand, and then there's like an amputee who's lost the hand on the right. <clears throat> but we can imagine taking my hand and removing one atom at a time, gradually transforming me uh, from, you know, uh, the arm I have now into the amputee. And like at what point there do I no longer have a hand? It seems absurd to suppose that there could be a, like a point where you know, like I have a hand and then removing a single atom destroys my hand. Um, but what this suggests is that our concept of hand is just incoherent. Um, and obviously this same kind of argument can be applied to any ordinary object. Uh, a similar argument can be made for uh, uh, boundaries, for the boundaries between bits of matter. So consider an atom that is in my shoulder. This atom is not part of my hand, but we can run a Sorites argument. If this atom is not part of my hand, then any atom located next to it is also not part of my hand. There's not going to be an exact clear line where the you know atoms in my body constitute a hand, where we go from you know non-hand to hand. 
But by repeated applications of this principle, we get the result that no atoms are part of my hand, not even the atoms in the centre of my palm. So I have no hands. And again, this argument can be run the other way. An atom at the centre of my palm is clearly part of my hand. But if that atom is part of my hand, then any atom located right next to it is also part of my hand. And by repeated applications of this principle, every atom in the universe is part of my hand. So, you know, <laughs> so that's the, the sorites. The, the natural kind of response to this sort of problem is to say, well, you know, like this is just overlooking the fact that like there are, you know, borderline cases, right? So there are some, there are some atoms um, so, so there, are, there are some objects, right, that are determinately hands, okay? And there are some objects that are determinately not hands. So like the thing at the end of my arm, um, that's, that's clearly a hand, that's determinately a hand. Whereas a single atom, that's clearly not a hand. But then, you know, look, there's just going to be cases where it's vague or indeterminate whether a collection of atoms forms a hand. There are borderline cases of hands. So if you were to take one of those objects and say, this object is a hand, well, that statement will be, you know, that would just be, that would be of indeterminate truth value. Um, it will be neither true nor false. Um, and similarly, you know, there are many atoms that are clearly part of my hand, many atoms that are clearly not part of my hand, but then there are some atoms where it's vague or indeterminate whether they're part of my hand. The atoms around, um, like, around the bottom of my hand and the top of my wrist, well, if you take one of those atoms, um, it's just indeterminate. Uh, so uh, there are vague boundaries, right? That's 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 a kind of natural <laughs> way of thinking about about Sorites problems. Unfortunately, this answer doesn't do much to help. <laughs> the trouble is that we seem to have simply traded one problematic boundary for two problematic boundaries, because now we have kind of three things, right? We now have um, collections of atoms that are determinately hands collections of atoms that are determinately not hands, and collections of atoms that are borderline cases. And we can now raise exactly the same problem as before. Where is the line between those things that are determinately hands and those things that are borderline cases? And where is the line between the borderline cases and the things that are determinately not hands? Um, so this only seems to have made our problem worse. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, this, this point about borderline cases, it, it really only seems to, to illustrate the Sorites problem. It doesn't seem to solve it. So this is one, um, one big issue. It seems that by, um, you know, <laughs> it seems that by uh, application of a, a very kind of plausible principle, we end up with the conclusion that, you know, either everything is just part of my hand or uh, nothing is a hand. The next problem is the ship of Theseus. So, uh, imagine a wooden ship called Theseus, uh, constructed at some time T1. And then over time, the planks of the ship come loose and are replaced by new shiny metal parts. Uh, eventually, several hundred years later at time T2, none of the original wooden planks remain. The ship is now entirely metal. And uh, we'd probably say, okay, yeah, this is, you know, the, the, the ship, this metal ship at T2, that's the same as the ship at T1, right? It's Theseus has undergone a change because these planks have been replaced gradually. We are dealing with a single object changing over time. You know, similarly to how like an acorn, that's that's got, you know, that's very different in many ways from an oak tree, but the acorn gradually develops into an oak tree. So it's, you know, one object that's undergoing change. So it seems to be with Theseus. We have a wooden ship gradually changing into a metal ship. But now, suppose that as the original planks of Theseus are discarded, a group of collectors have been saving the planks and reconstructing the wooden ship out of them. So in the end, they have a wooden ship that is made of the planks of the original Theseus, with all of the planks in their original positions. So now we have two ships. Originally there was Theseus, a wooden ship. And, and now we have, on the one hand, a metal ship, that was created from Theseus by gradually replacing the planks. And we also have a wooden ship reconstructed from the original planks of Theseus. Then the question is, which of these two ships is the original ship of Theseus? Like if, if somebody was looking to purchase the ship of Theseus, which one should they buy? Should they buy the metal ship or the reconstructed ship? 
So one thought here is, well, clearly a ship can survive the replacement of its parts, right? Like, an, an, like in general, okay, objects can have their parts replaced and they can they can you know undergo change so they can survive the replacement of the parts so we might say ah the metal ship is the ship of theseus but then another another thought is well clearly a ship can survive being disassembled and then reassembled so the reconstructed ship is the ship of theseus okay it seems like both of those seem very plausible so in this case you know when we ask like okay uh, which of these is the ship of Theseus? Well, in this case, we have five options, and all of these options have some rather obvious problems. So one option we could, we, is, is to say that Theseus is identical only to the metal ship. Another option is to say that Theseus is identical only to the reconstructed sh ship. The trouble with both of these options is that they seem completely arbitrary. I mean, it seems like both the metal ship and the reconstructed ship have a, a kind of equal claim to being Theseus, right? Like, again, it's, it's very plausible that an object can survive uh, its parts being replaced, and it's very plausible that an object can survive being disassembled and reassembled. So it looks like both of these things have, you know, equal claim to being identical to Theseus. Uh, so why would we say that Theseus is identical only to one of them? Okay, a third option is to say that Theseus is identical to both the metal ship and the reconstructed ship. But the problem here is, if Theseus is identical to uh, uh, the metal ship and Theseus is identical to the reconstructed ship, then it follows that the metal ship must be identical to the reconstructed ship. So if, you know, if X is the same thing as Y and Y is the same thing as Z, then X must be the same thing as Z, because what we're saying here is that X, Y and Z are just one and the same thing. Um, but clearly the metal ship and the reconstructed ship are not identical. They are in different locations with different material parts. So you know, the metal ship and the reconstructed ship are not one and the same thing. So Theseus cannot be one and the same thing as both the metal ship and the reconstructed ship. A fourth option is to say that Theseus has at some point ceased to exist. So Theseus is identical to neither ships. But then at what point did this happen? And why? <laughs> I mean, so I, I mean, like this. This would be a, a kind of a strange, uh, a strange response because, in 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 this case, we have a kind of double success, right? Like we we are inclined to say that Theseus can survive the replacement of its parts, and we're also inclined to say that it can survive being disassembled and reassembled, right? Like if only one of these things had occurred, we would find it perfectly natural to say that Theseus survives. Like if if only so if the only thing that had happened is that its parts were replaced we would be like oh yeah that's a single ship changing over time right but the thing is both of them have happened um so it's like we have an embarrassment of riches but like how 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 if like if just one of these things is sufficient for theseus to continue existing um how can the fact that both of them have taken place lead to theseus ceasing to exist <laughs> Um, and then a fifth option is to say that uh, there just are no ships, that Theseus never existed in the first place. This is, of course, the view of the compositional nihilist. There are swarms of atoms arranged shipwise, but these never compose a further object. They never compose a ship. So the question of which, if any, of the later ships is identical to Theseus just doesn't arise, right? There, there never was a Theseus, and there isn't a metal ship, and there isn't a reconstructed ship. There are just these swarms of atoms um, which, like, uh, c create the illusion of objects. And so, you know, it's, yeah, it's not surprising that we would end up with these, um, you know, kind of strange scenarios where we're not sure which object is identical to which one, you know, when uh, when we try to work out how this uh, how this illusion is working in this in this situation. Um, so yeah, that's the uh, the ship of Theseus problem, and obviously this same kind of uh, problem can be raised for for any ordinary object. <clears throat> Next, there is the argument from arbitrariness. Uh, the basic idea of this argument is that there is no relevant difference between uh, ordinary objects and various kind of exotic or artificial objects that we would not normally believe exist. So consider what we might call in cars and out cars. Suppose that my car is parked inside the garage. Um, so we, we'd usually say, you know, when I 
drive like I can drive my car outside the garage and the car will continue to exist wherever I drive it. Fair enough. But now suppose we define a new object, um, call it an in-car. An in-car exists inside the garage as a matter of metaphysical necessity. So once the car is driven outside the garage, the in-car ceases to exist. As, as the in-car moves through the garage door, it gets smaller and smaller, losing its parts. At the same time, a new object, an out-car, comes into existence outside the garage. Um, th like the, 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 the existence of the out-car is caused by the movement of the in-car and the out-car grows as the in-car <laughs> disappears through the door. Um, and then, of course, you know, th then there's an out-car, and then once I drive back into the garage, the out-car goes out of existence and a new in-car comes into existence. Okay, in-cars and out-cars are strange objects. Um, we don't usually think of uh, uh, the world in, in these terms, you know, it's, uh, we don't usually think that in-cars really exist in the way that cars really exist. Um, but now consider islands. Islands are ordinary, common-sense objects. But islands appear to be just like in-cars. In-cars cease to exist when the matter that constitutes the in-car leaves the garage. So the existence of, of an in-car is dependent on its surrounding environment. But similarly, islands cease to exist either when the sea level rises and submerges the matter that constitutes the island, or when the sea level falls so that the matter uh, connecting the island to the rest of the country is now above the water. For both uh, in-cars and islands, uh, the matter that constitutes the object could undergo no change whatsoever while the object itself goes in and out of existence. There seems to be no relevant difference between islands and in-cars. They are objects of the same kind. So it's arbitrary to believe that islands are genuine objects while in-cars are merely artificial constructions. So one way to put this argument is there is no ontologically significant difference between islands and in-cars. If there is no ontologically significant difference between islands and in-cars, then uh, if islands exist, in-cars exist. Islands exist, so in-cars exist. Or of course, we could go uh, the other way and say, you know, <clears throat> if in-cars do not exist, islands do not exist, in-cars do not exist, so islands do not exist. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so that's um, <laughs> that's that's a kind of puzzle, right? It's it seems that there's not a that there's not some significant or relevant difference between between ordinary objects and these sort of strange or exotic objects that uh, we we don't usually think of the world as containing. Um, and okay, a another argument um, appeals to the problem of the boundary between causality and constitution. So uh, consider uh, the question, what is a car? Well, we usually take it that a car is dependent on its shape and arrangement of parts, or a car is partly defined by its shape and arrangement of parts. If you remove all of the metal from a car or crush it so that it's a single mass of matter, then you no longer have a car. But the shape of a car is dependent on its surroundings, uh, the temperature and pressure inside the garage, for example. If you increase the temperature too far, the shape will change or it will begin melting. Uh, so in order for the car to be the way it is, in order for it to be a car, for it to have a particular shape, a particular colour, for it to produce particular kinds of sounds when I tap it, the surrounding environment must be just the way it is. So this raises the question, like, well, why exactly are ordinary objects defined in terms of particular dependencies, but not others. So like we take it that the, the garage, let's say, that contains the car, so the garage having a particular pressure and temperature, that's one of the things that causally sustains the car. It's a, it's a causal influence on the car. So the pressure and temperature of the room are not themselves part of the car. They are not constitutive of the car, right? They are causal influences on it. They are things that cause it to be the way it is, but they're not part of it. So in general, then, we can take any object, right? There are some things that have a causal influence on the object, and there are other things that are constitutive of the object. The pressure of the room is a causal influence. The arrangement is a causal influence on the car. The arrangement of metal is constitutive of the car. But we might wonder, well, why draw the line in this kind of way? 
So instead of our ordinary car, which is a mass of metal and plastic with a particular shape, we might see other objects here. So one alternative is what I'm calling a B car. A B car is constituted not just by the metal and plastic, but it extends into the surrounding environment. It is constituted partly by the temperature, pressure and materials of the environment that surrounds it. When I put my hands on the car, I therefore become part of the B car. Um, another alternative is an S car. An S car is constituted only by the visible surface of all the parts of the car. So as with the ordinary car, the temperature and pressure of the room are merely causal influences um, that help to sustain the S car in the way it is. They're not constitutive of the S car. But unlike the ordinary car, all the material, all the metal and plastic beyond the visible surfaces are also taken to be merely causal influences on the S car. These materials are not constitutive of the S car. So the metal one millimeter below the surface of the car is sort of taken to be analogous to the temperature and pressure of the room outside the car. It has a causal influence on it, but it's not constitutive of it. Well, B cars and S cars are strange objects. We don't usually think of the world in these terms, but why not? Uh, what's, like, what's the relevant difference between these and cars? Um, notice that our perception of objects can be accounted for just as well in terms of you know, B cars or S cars. Like when I look outside my window, I ordinarily take it that, okay, I'm perceiving a car. But like, why isn't it just as reasonable to say that I'm perceiving a B car or that I'm perceiving an S car? Both of these, uh, you know, both the B car and the S car would result in exactly the same perceptual experience. And uh, even most of our ordinary talk about cars could probably be, you know, rephrased <laughs> into, into talk of B cars uh, or S cars. Um, like, uh, you know, I mean, so in in the case of a B car, yes, there are some sort of, you know, it, what would what would happen is with a B car, um, you know, as it moves around, then its sort of properties are like uh, changing significantly, quite frequently. Like if it's in a garage, well, you know, the temperature and pressure uh, of of the B car as it moves out of the garage that will then change. Um, but you know, things change. That's, that's true of like my body, for instance, the, my body temperature might change somewhat over time, or as I put food into it, like I'm going to have different parts in my body and so on. So, you know, with, um, you know, with, with S cars, it's, it, it seems e actually to me even more natural. Like I, I, you know, um, like why not? Why shouldn't the, 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 the material that's just one millimeter under the surface be a mere causal influence rather than constitutive of it? Um, so, uh, yeah, again, I mean, maybe this is kind of another form of, of the sort of arbitrariness argument. The question is like, okay, well, like, what's the relevant difference between these and just ordinary cars? Um, and not obvious what that is. Okay, uh, another challenge to ordinary objects is, is the thought that ordinary objects are in some way in conflict with the picture of the world provided by our best scientific theories. The classic example of this is Arthur Eddington's story of the two tables. So <clears throat> as I write at my desk, Eddington says, I find that there are actually two tables in front of me. On the one hand, there is the table of ordinary experience. There is this object that is permanent, it is coloured, it is a thing that occupies space and it is uh, it, it is solid or substantial in the sense that it presents as a substance completely filling space. On the other hand, in the same place as the ordinary table is another table, the, the scientific table. Um, and this is a, a, a much stranger thing. The scientific table is mostly empty space. It's mostly insubstantial. It's mostly absence. Scattered within that empty space is a collection of atoms with electric charges rushing about. This collection of atoms has no colour, no smell. It makes no sound when you touch it. Instead, we would speak of how light interacts with its surface spectral reflectance or how, you know, creating vibrations in the collection of atoms causes a wave to propagate through the air. Um, Anything that is placed on this table is prevented from passing through it, not by a substance filling space, but by a series of tiny blows from a swarm underneath. The scientific table is not an ordinary object, but it's the only object that's really there. Um, 
So our, our best scientific theories do not seem to postulate ordinary objects. In fact, even putting this as Eddington did and talking of, you know, the scientific table, that's something of a misnomer because fundamental physics doesn't talk about tables in any sense, right? Table is just not a term that is used in, you know, scientific physicalist descriptions of the world. Um, instead, physics provides a completely different framework for talking about reality. It's, it uses, you know, concepts like, you know, fermion and boson, energy and mass, force and field. And then these things are going to be governed by laws expressed in mathematical equations. It doesn't talk about tables. Um, but then the argument will go, it is precisely these theories that we should take as guiding our beliefs about what exists. When, where science can, competes or conflicts with common sense, science wins. Uh, so as Wilfred Sellers once put it, there is, and I quote, a sense in which the scientific picture of the world replaces the common sense picture. A sense in which the scientific account of what there is supersedes the descriptive ontology of everyday life. Our best science is the measure of all things. Um, and, uh, well, it, it, it doesn't postulate tables or, or other ordinary objects. So ordinary objects are, are mere appearances, illusions. When, you know, when, I, when I look out in my room, like, I'm inclined to say I see a table. And this table is uh, something that is substantial, apparently filling up the space that it occupies. Um, by contrast, you know, scientific theories tell me that actually in the direction I'm looking, there's just this kind of swarm of particles. Um, uh, and particles with particular properties and then that transitions into like a different swarm of particles with different properties it's kind of scattered in empty space um this swarm of particles has no you know has no like properties like color um that i would ordinarily attribute to the table so uh, yeah the, the objects and properties postulated in our common sense framework just don't have a role in the scientific framework now of course there are connections between these frameworks Scientific theories are tested against observation and observations are ultimately going to be described in terms of things that we perceive, which uh, I mean, I suppose we'll take to be ordinary objects. Um, so if, you know, if we ask like, well, why should we trust the scientific description of the table? Well, I mean, we would naturally describe that by saying that, that there are certain scientific experiments that may be performed using the table. So like maybe we could demonstrate that the table is mostly empty space by taking a very thin sheet of the table and then firing alpha particles at it. And you will find that most of those particles penetrate straight through the sample of the table. Obviously, in order to describe this experiment, we're using the terminology of ordinary objects. But the point is that the picture of the world that is ultimately supported by these experiments, so the scientific theories that are developed in fundamental physics, this is a picture on which there is, you know, there is no concept table. Um, so by starting out with ordinary objects and then investigating them, right, it turns out that ordinary objects are illusory. That would be the thought. Uh, of course, it's worth noting that um, we might object to some of the scientific details of what's been said here. The notion that objects are mostly empty space arguably relies on a, uh, a form of physics that has been superseded. We now know that fundamental particles like electrons have wave-like properties. They don't occupy any determinate position. It's better to think of them as clouds of probabilities smeared over a region of space than as solid tiny particles in a determinate location. Um, but, uh, of course, once we start looking at like these, these details of quantum physics, we find that nature behaves in, in very strange ways. Uh, the notion that objects are constituted by clouds of probabilities is no less bizarre, I think, than the notion that they're mostly empty space. So, um, uh, it, it seems that, <clears throat> you know, even if the science has kind of moved on from when Eddington wrote, it remains the case, uh, that there is this at least apparent uh, conflict between science and common sense, or at least it's, it's not obvious how to make these two uh, uh, pictures of the world compatible. So that is, that is another challenge. Okay then, a final, uh, a final challenge to ordinary objects is presented by genealogical debunking arguments. Uh, the general idea of a genealogical debunking argument is that we can give an explanation for how our beliefs about a certain domain arose, and we can try to show that this explanation of our beliefs 
undermines the justification for those beliefs. Uh, this kind of argument has received a lot of attention in meta-ethics, so there are some moral anti-realists who argue that our moral attitudes are a product of our evolutionary history, and that we would have evolved the same moral values even if there were no moral facts, or even if the moral facts were completely different. So like, even if it was morally good to just go around killing people, we would still feel that killing is morally wrong, because norms against killing each other uh, promoted survival and reproduction among our ancestors. Uh, I have a video on debunking arguments in metaethics if you are interested in learning more about that topic. So, um, anyway, uh, you know, these, these kinds of arguments can be, can be applied in other domains as well, and the general structure of a debunking argument looks like this. We have a causal premise which says S's belief that P is explained by X, an epistemic premise which says that uh, X does not track the truth, or it's not sensitive to the truth in that domain, and so uh, S's belief that P is unjustified. So the <clears throat> the argument against ordinary objects um, would be, look, we would have evolved to distinguish objects in pretty much the same way we do now, even if there were no objects, or even if the facts about objects were completely different. So our beliefs about what objects exist are a result of these kind of evolutionary and cultural influences and they're not they're not like tracking the truth about you know the object facts so let's let's give an example right so when i look out across the savanna um i see various objects you know maybe i see a lion maybe i see a tiger maybe i see a tree um this being a, a philosophical thought experiment we can grant the wild assumption that lions and tigers are occupying the same territory um but anyway yes i'm i'm, I'm looking out across this fictional savannah which contains both lions and tigers um but you know we've seen look i might in principle carve up the world in completely different ways so instead of distinguishing the lion and the tiger i might say instead that there are two ligers one liger is composed of the front part of the lion and the back part of the tiger. The other liger is composed of the uh, front half of the tiger and the back half of the lion. Um, or I might suppose that there is, uh, let's say, a tree lion and a tree tiger. A tree lion is an object composed of a tree plus whichever lion is closest to the tree. A tree tiger is a tree plus you know, whichever tiger is closest to the tree. Um, similarly, maybe there are maybe there are tree ligers, right? Like, I mean, you can uh, obviously you know carve carve things up in all sorts of wild ways. Now, the the sort of natural intuitive view of the scene in front of me is that it contains a lion, a tiger, a tree, and probably every human being would classify it in basically the same way. I mean, even, even if they didn't have any concept of like lions and tigers. So maybe they're from an Inuit tribe that has never encountered these objects. Even so, when the Inuit looks at this scene, um, the lion and the tiger would strike them as being like proper objects. Whereas a, a liger would just be a, you know, that would just be like a bizarre artificial construction. Um, so the point is, you know, we don't, we don't need to have like the concept lion um, we just kind of perceptually, like when when we see you know this this animal out there moving around, like we take that as an object, right? Whereas the front half of this animal and the back half of this animal, that just yeah, that seems like a really bizarre construction. So why do we carve up the world into lions, tigers, and trees as opposed to any of these other myriad ways we could carve it up? Well, here's what might be going on, right? Humans evolved to uh, uh, to perceive the world in such a way that certain collections of properties that behave in certain ways over time um, jump out at us or capture our attention and and it's you know the things that like th there are things that like jump out at us and it's those things that we are inclined to demarcate as being genuine objects and we inv we evolved to uh, demarcate such objects in whatever ways happened to promote survival and reproduction Taking certain swarms of particles to be a single object, a lion, that helped us to easily identify and avoid potential threats to life. Um, taking certain other swarms to compose a, a tree, well, maybe that helped us to identify food or resources or to identify, you, you know, shelter or, or whatever. Now, exotic objects like ligers, well, that would be 
just far too taxing to try to track that, and it, it, it wouldn't confer any particular benefit. So, like, the, the person who tracks ligers, right, um, I, I suppose they are similarly able to identify threats as the person who tracks lions and tigers, but it's just much more difficult to keep track of, like, you know, the front half of this animal and the back half of this animal. That's way, way, way more difficult. Um, I mean, maybe you'll similarly be able to, like, if you can do it, then yeah, that will sit, that will help you to avoid threats, but it's just going to require, like, much, much more um, uh, work. Um, so, you know, I, like, t treating certain collections of atoms as lions, that's easy, and it helps us to avoid threats. So, um, the thought is this. Look, we don't need to track the truth about whether atoms arranged lion-wise compose a genuine object, right? That, that doesn't really matter. We only need to track the truth about whether there are atoms arranged lion-wise and what those atoms are doing. Um, however, precisely because we need to track atoms arranged lion-wise, we will class them as a genuine object. So the thought is that even if it were false that there were lions, even if atoms arranged lion-wise did not compose lions, we would still believe in lions. And even if it were true that there were ligers, even if it were true that there were objects composed of the front half of lions and the back half of tigers, we would still not believe in ligers. We would still have no inclination to, you know, identify those as genuine objects. So this gives us uh, the following argument. The causal premise is that our evolutionary history explains why we have the object beliefs that we do. The epistemic premise is that Evolution is not truth tracking with respect to the object facts. We would have the same object beliefs regardless of what the object facts are, at least as, as long as we kind of, you, you know, the, the facts about all of the atoms <laughs> remain the same. So our object beliefs are unjustified. Um, I mean, another way to put this is that the facts about which objects genuinely compose further objects, the facts about what the real objects are, they play no role in explaining why we have the object beliefs that we do. There is no explanatory connection between our object beliefs and the object facts. Our object beliefs are the result of what was adaptive, you know, for our perceptual systems, but the facts about, like, which arrangements of atoms form genuine objects, that, that, does, that doesn't explain why we demarcate particular arrangements as objects. And given this, it would be a remarkable coincidence if our object beliefs happened to match the object facts. If our object beliefs happened to match the object facts, it would just that would just be like a lucky coincidence. Um, so as Ted Sider puts it, on the common sense view, and I quote, the entities that exist correspond exactly with the categories for continuance in our conceptual scheme. Trees, aggregates, statues, lumps, persons, bodies, and so on. How convenient. It would be nothing short of a miracle if reality just happened to match our conceptual scheme in this way. Uh, similarly, John Hawthorne says, and I quote, Wouldn't it be remarkable if the lines of reality matched the lines that we have words for? The simplest exercises of sociological imagination ought to convince us that the assumption of such a harmony is altogether untoward, since such exercises convince us that it is something of a biological and or cultural accident that we draw the lines where we do. Um, so, you know, if we, if we ask the question, like, you know, wh why, why do we believe in ordinary objects in the first place? And I, I think the primary reason, for most of us at least, is, well, it just seems so obvious. It just seems intuitive, right, that, that such objects exist. You know, I open my eyes and I just see a computer, a table, a chair. I just see a pair of hands. Um, this is the common sense view of the world. This debunking argument aims to undermine the force of these intuitions, because what it's saying is, well, we would have the same intuitions, we would have the same inclinations, regardless of what the facts were about material composition. Okay, well, um, that's all for this video. Uh, those were some of the uh, puzzles about ordinary objects. Um, hope you found that interesting. Uh, goodbye.